I have to confess to a certain feeling of poignancy at this moment. It's very strange to celebrate the life of R.B. Kitai, but not to have him here with us. His death five years ago really seems like yesterday. And as I reflect on this great artist and dear friend, I will at times be mixing the personal and the more sober analytic. I first met Kitai at my home university, UCLA, when he came to give a lecture in June 1999. The theme of the lecture was one of his perennial obsessions, the Jewish question in art. The lecture, I must admit, was not an oratorical tour de force. It was long and a bit rambling, two qualities which I hope not to repeat tonight, but it was so rich with ideas, so bold and provocative in insights, that I was almost left speechless. From that point until his death in 2007, Kitai and I were conversation partners, brought together by a shared reading list, a set of intellectual heroes, and themes of interest. His mode of thinking was decidedly unlike mine. His was explosively visual and unburdened by the disciplinary boundaries, the footnotes of the scholar. But for all his wildness, Kitai's thinking was deep and wide, as attentive to the text as to the image, which of course drove the London art critics mad, for they insisted that a, a picture couldn't stand alone without words. And if it did attempt to, in fact, be accompanied by words, it wasn't worthy of attention. I suppose in this regard, I have a somewhat different take than that presented in our last panel by Michael Cullen, exactly what I've described as Kitai's voracious, autodidactic, untrained, wild reading is the hallmark for me of an intellectual, as distinct from the more disciplined curriculum of the scholar. In any event, this already pushes me to the first of my main points for this evening, the imperative of commentary in Kitai's work. But before we get to commentary, or more specifically, my commentary on Kitai's practice of commentary, I'd like to take a step back and declare that my main goal this evening is to explore the eccentric Jewish, Jewish life that Kitai led, and to do so in a way that reflected his own tendencies. And so, I will compile a list, which is something that Kitai himself loved to do. Here you see before you an image of a list of Kitai's favorite paintings that he agreed to uh, produce for a journal which I edit, the Jewish Quarterly Review. And here is my list for the evening. My list consists of five key concepts in Kitai's Jewish life. To give them some firmer grounding, I will try to map them onto a cultural geography of Kitai's peripatetic life journey. This is a map that was drawn by Kitai himself on a napkin from the Coffee Bean Cafe in Westwood, near the UCLA campus, where he would go at 6 a.m. every morning. He left behind hundreds of napkins filled with reflections and sketches, all on the Coffee Bean uh, napkins and they have been collected in the Kitai archive at UCLA. So the napkin before us offers us a mapping of the key stations in Kitai's life, as well as you see towards the bottom, a kind of autobiographical figuration of his own demise, as represented by the figure who moves from an upright position on the left to a declining position on the right. Let's begin in the top left with Ohio which, by the way, is the focus of all of the media attention in the United States because it seems to hold the fate of the next presidential election. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, 
Ohio is where Ronald Brooks was born in a suburb of Cleveland in 1932. His parents divorced in 1934, and then his mother remarried in 1941 to Dr. Walter Kitai, an Austrian Jew whose last name the young boy assumed. There was no demonstrable Jewish ritual or learning that took place in the home. But the experience of the emigre Central European Jew was very much alive in the household. Kitai's family moved to Troy, New York. You see Troy to the immediate right of Ohio when he was a child, and there he went to high school. On completion, he joined the Merchant Marines and sailed the world. This is the reference immediately to the right of Troy to the high seas. Then began his training as an artist, first at the Cooper Union in New York, then Vienna at the Academy der Bildenden Kunst, and then in London. Now, I don't want to reprise his entire life here. Um, there will be ample opportunity to catch up on it by reading the catalog and hearing the other presentations tomorrow. What I do want to emphasize is that for much of his early life, from his birth through the beginning of his London experience, there was relatively little access to or engagement with Jewish concerns. Direct engagement with Jewish themes and personalities came in the 1970s and 80s as Kitai turned his attention with increasing awareness and intensity to the Jewish question. And yet there are some tantalizing anticipations of his later Jewish obsession, evident already, I think, in 1963, with the opening of his first solo show at the Marlborough Gallery in London. This was, to be sure, an intriguing period in many ways, in his life and uh, in uh, the Jewish, late, the late 20th century, Jewishly. His show opened in February, the same month in which an article appeared in the uh, popular American journal, The New Yorker, an article that, as Kitai reported, quote, broke the Jewish ice for me. The article in question was Hannah Arendt's account of the Eichmann trial, which would form the basis of her famous book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil. At that critical moment in his Jewish formation, Kitai was opening his show in London under the title, Pictures with Commentary, Pictures Without Commentary. Why is this significant? And so we come to the first of my key terms. Already at this early stage, Kitai chose to engage in an act for which he would become both famous and infamous, popular and unpopular. And that act was to place alongside his paintings written texts, witticisms, aphorisms, philosophical and historical meditations, art criticism. He did not give voice at that point to what he would later come to embrace, namely that he was a link in a long and dynamic chain of the Jewish interpretive tradition. Nothing could be more integral to the evolution of Judaism as a religion than this imperative to engage in commentary. Hafochba v'hafochba, it reads in the third century Pirkei Avot, the ethical teachings embedded in the first major written embodiment of the Jewish oral law, the Mishnah. That means turn it over again and again. Turn the biblical text over again and again because everything is contained within it. This was not a marginal and neglected phenomenon in the history of Judaism. It was a central impulse. Well before the time of Jesus, Jewish sages engaged in ceaseless commentary on the Bible, as well as on the accompanying oral law that lent Judaism its distinctive ritual habits. It is this oral law associated with the Pharisees that the early Christians, or at least most of them, left behind. But for Jews, interpreting and commentary on the sacred text constituted their very being. The text that resulted from this interpreting and commenting became, in the very famous words of Heine and George Steiner, the portable homeland of the Jews. 
Indeed, the Mishnah begat the Talmud, which begat rabbinic commentaries, and it's these texts that regulated and ordered the lives of Jews who from the year 70 AD or CE had lost sovereignty over their homeland. With the rise of rabbinic interpreters came dynamism, flexibility, malleability in the interpretive process. And it's that set of qualities that Kitai loved and identified with as a commentator. As he relates in the second of his two diasporist manifestos. There, he quoted that famous imperative to turn it over again and again. And then he added, fitful commentary waits patiently by some of my pictures, as it does in thousands of years of Jewish commentary. Although he was not a rabbi, and surely not an observant Jew, Kitai boldly and proudly inserted himself into that millennial tradition. Commentary was not mere wordplay for him. It was constitutive. It defined, animated, and invigorated Jews. It sustained them, especially throughout their long history in dispersion. And this brings me to the second of the five core terms in Kitai's, <coughs> in Kitai's eccentric Jewish life, diaspora. Diaspora is the Greek term for scattering or dispersion. In Jewish history, it is a somewhat more neutral term than exile, which in Hebrew is known as galut, as opposed to diaspora, gola, similar root but very different meanings. Exile implies not only a state of physical displacement, but also theological estrangement between the Israelites and God. In Kitai's lexicon, diaspora, and to a certain extent exile, became terms of paramount significance because he saw himself as dwelling for much of his life in a state of displacement as an American in London for nearly 40 years and indeed even in the last decade of his life in Los Angeles. The significance of diaspora in his life and thought became quite clear in the year 1988 when he published, initially in German, his Erstes Manifestes Dasporismus, followed next year by the English First Diasporist Manifesto. And then in 2007, <clears throat> the year of his death, he published his Second Diasporist Manifesto. In fact, so thoroughly did he identify with the concept that he signed his name at the end of the introduction to the second manifesto as simply, quote, the diaspora, unquote. And yet it's interesting to reflect for a moment on his choice of language in the titles. It is not diaspora manifesto, but diasporist manifesto. This suggests not merely an acknowledgement of the fact of dispersion, physical dispersion, but an ideological commitment to the state of displacement from the homeland. And why would that be? What is there to venerate and revere in diasporism? Kitai offers up these questions repeatedly, though never systematically in his manifestos. That's one of the marks of his particular strain of intellectualism, of being an intellectual, the lack of systematization, the lack of consistency. But among the features of diasporism, as an affirmative path in life and art that he notes in the first manifesto are, one, its ability to be both internationalist and particularist. Two, the fact that people are always saying that meaning in my pictures refuses to be fixed, to be settled, to be stable. That's diasporism, he continues, which welcomes interesting creative misreadings. Or third, its status, diasporism status, as a universal conundrum, he writes, a most ancient mystery, presence, a secreted reflection upon one's uneasy world. All of these af aphorisms point to the dynamic and unstable condition of diasporism, a condition that, ironically enough, was well-suited for artistic and cultural creativity, 
for it allowed for, indeed even necessitated, iconoclasm and violation of the established rules. Now, on his reading, one needn't be Jewish to be a diasporist. He noted that Picasso, Cezanne, Mondrian, with their ferocious spirit of innovation, all belong to the diasporist tradition. At the same time, diasporism was for Kitai the quintessential Jewish condition. It was the condition in which the ceaseless interpretive practices of the rabbis were incubated. It was the condition of that historical figure who so fascinated him. The Murano, the Iberian converso, forcibly converted from Judaism to Christianity beginning in the late 14th century, who came to live outwardly as a Catholic and inwardly as a Jew, once described famously by the German scholar Karl Gebhardt in the following terms, der Marana ist ein Katholik ohne Glauben und eine, ein Jude ohne Wissen. The Murano has been a figure of keen, recurrent, ongoing fascination to modern Jews, especially German Jews, who recognized themselves in the mirror that reflected the Murano's dual, divided, competing identities, outwardly Catholic, inwardly Jewish. Now, beyond the Murano, which is here represented in its characteristically idiosyncratic way by Kitai, diasporism was not only the condition, but the ideological predis predisposition of a whole strain of modern Jewish nationalists who aspired not principally to return to the homeland, but rather to establish a state-supported cultural preserve in the diaspora. Figures such as the great historian Simon Dubnov, who lived in Berlin from 1922 to 1933, or the writer and territorialist Israel Zangwill make appearances in Kitai's first diasporist manifesto. They are the ideological opponents of Zionism. Zionists hope for a revived Jewish presence in Eretz Israel, in the land of Israel, Palestine. I'll come back to Kitai and Zionism uh, in a minute. The Zionists saw the diasporists, such as those two gentlemen represent here, as their ideological foils. Kitai sought to navigate between the two, uh, the two ideological poles, as we'll see. And in this regard, I think he would have parted ways with uh, a recent visitor to this institution, uh, the American literary critic Judith Butler, who spoke here on September 15th. Butler lays claim in her recent book, Parting Ways, to Jewish diasporic traditions, as she called them, as part of her sharp critique of Zionism and the state of Israel. Kitai had a somewhat different view that I will get to in a minute, but I do want to just finish off the discussion of his diasporism. Perhaps the paradigmatic diasporous character in his artistic imagination is Joe Singer, the recurrent subject of artistic interest for him. Who was Joe Singer? Well, Kitai tells us that Joe Singer was the name of a man his mother dated in the 1930s. This figure, Joe Singer, became the recurrent model for Kitai's diaspora Jew, displaced, in transit, not fully belonging. Of his own painting of the mythic Joe Singer, here under the title The Jew, etc., Kitai writes, in this picture, I intend Joe, my emblematic Jew, to be the unfinished subject of an aesthetic of entrapment and escape, an endless, tainted, galut passage, wherein he acts out his own unfinish. So entrapment and escape the poles between, the between which the diaspora Jew moves and the space, the middle ground, on which the diaspora Jew, liberated from convention but constrained by danger, creates. London was such a place for Kitai, a site of both escape and entrapment, of creativity and hostility. And this brings us to the third of our key terms in Kitai's Jewish life. 
anti-Semitism. It was anti-Semitism that ultimately drove Kitai away from his home of 40 years, from London to Los Angeles, as it had for diaspora Jews for millennia. Kitai's first encounter with anti-Semitism must have come early enough. He grew up with a consciousness of Central European anti-Semitism through the presence of his stepfather, Walter Kitai, who came uh, from Vienna immediately after the Anschluss. While Kitai loved and to a great extent lived the cosmopolitan existence of Mittel Europa, he also understood well the dangers and risks of cosmopolitanism. 1963, that fateful year when he read Arendt on Eichmann and broke the Jewish ice, is when he started to come to deeper awareness of the Shoah through major works of literature and history. As he tells us, he read then Levy, Wiesel, Hilberg, Davidovich, and so on throughout the 1960s, a process that, he trans that, that transformed him, he writes, in a wonderful image from, quote, a young caterpillar of the universalist pretension of art into a Jewish butterfly of particularist energies. That particularism was increasingly with time unabashed, unvarnished, unapologetic, a kind of version of what, we might, of what we might call the tough Jew, hardened by the persistence of anti-Semitism and by a lingering obsession with the Shoah. In fact, when we think of it, this is what made Kitai such a unique character and thinker, his ability to hold on to and embody opposites like particularism and universalism. On the one hand, his deep appreci appreciation for and identification with Joe Singer, the displaced cosmopolitan for whom the text was really the homeland. And on the other, an appreciation for the tough Jew who acknowledged and confronted anti-Semitism head on, indeed who defied it. This defiance became a living credo for the later and bolder Jewish Kitai, especially after the Tate Gallery retrospective in 1994, which we'll hear about tomorrow. That show which unleashed a torrent of negative reviews that Kitai not only regarded as anti-Semitic in origin, but as responsible for the premature death of his beloved wife, Sandra Fisher. Paint the opposite of anti-Semitism, he wrote defiantly in at least five places in the Second Diasporas Manifesto. And he continued to be haunted by the Shoah, which he called an evil equal to God, infinite. He tried to stop paying attention to it, but he couldn't. I always swear off, he said, reading any more about the murder of two-thirds of the European Jews, and then I read some more. This working through of his obsession yielded a variation of the famous 614th commandment formulated by the philosopher Emil Fackenheim. There are 613 commandments that observant Jews seek to uphold. Fackenheim, after the Holocaust, added a 614th, which was, do not hand Hitler yet another posthumous victory. Kitai's 614th aphorism in the Second Manifesto repeated Fackenheim's injunction and then continued, so be it, now paint it, which he attempted to do. Passion, as he described a series of paintings. Here, this iteration of passion places side by side the crucifix and the death camp chimney, playing on the meaning of Holocaust as burnt sacrifice and hinting at the inextricability of Christian anti-Semitism and the later genocidal impulses found in Nazism. A logical consequence of Kitai's defiant response to anti-Semitism was an appreciation for Zionism. And here we should distinguish between different kinds of Zionism. Consistent with his tough Jew attitude, Kitai often expressed in conversation appreciation for the Sabra, the rough-edged Israeli type, who was, to a great extent, the natural outgrowth of Max Nordau's famous 
fin de siècle call for a muscul judentum to take rise. And yet the Zionism that intrigued him most was a different, more refined vintage. The, the Zionism of early 20th century Hebrew essayist Achad Ha'am, who aspired not to a Jewish state, but to a center of Jewish culture in Palestine. And among the followers of Achad Ha'am's path toward a Jewish cultural revival in Palestine were a number of Kitai's idols from the Weimar era, including Martin Buber and Gershom Scholem. He admired the way, Kitai admired the way that figures such as Buber and Scholem navigated the course between Zionist particularism and a humanitarian and humane universalism. After all, he himself valued Zionism, the quest for a home for the Jews, along with diasporism, its seeming opposite. This was characteristic of his late blooming and self-taught Jewish knowledge, its omnivorous nature and its relative lack of concern for consistency. It made for a rare ideological blend. But the time has come to move on to our fourth concept, anchoring Kitai's Jewish Weltanschau, Kabbalah. Here too we see a mix of seeming opposites. On one hand, an avowed lifelong commitment to secularism, and on the other, a deep engagement with Jewish mysticism that yielded at the end of his life an idiosyncratic, even heretical theology. Kitai's model for this mix, and a link to our previous concept, was Gershom Scholem, who came from a relatively impoverished Berlin home in terms of its Jewish commitments and knowledge, but would go on to become the most important scholar of Jewish studies in the 20th century. It was not only Sholem's distinctive Zionist path that appealed to Kitai, it was also his self-described status as a religious anarchist that spoke to Kitai. Like Kitai, Sholem came from a position of secular indifference to a place of respect for, if not always embrace of, the vitalizing effects of religion, especially Kabbalah. But let's step back for one second and ask, what is Kabbalah? It's a word that comes from the Hebrew verb to receive, particularly as in to receive a tradition, a received tradition. In the Jewish religion, Kabbalah refers to a powerful strain of Jewish mysticism that was attributed to the second century Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, but which most likely took rise much later in the 13th century in northern Spain and southern France. Now, Jewish mysticism surely existed in various incarnations earlier, indeed in antiquity, and those currents nurtured the growth of the medieval form of Jewish mysticism, mysticism known as Kabbalah. The great achievement of Gershom Sholem, who was one of Kitai's most significant heroes, was to ex excavate virtually every known and many unknown, significant texts of Kabbalah written, and there were thousands of manuscripts, and analyzed them with philological precision and conceptual sophistication. In doing so, Sholem made a very compelling case to place mysticism not on the margins of Jewish thought, as 19th century Jewish scholars had done, but at the very center of Jewish thought and life. Sholem was particularly drawn to the subversive dynamism of Kabbalah, and he linked it to his own youthful discovery of Zionism, which provided him with escape from his insufferably boring bourgeois family life. Now, our hero, Kitai, began to read Sholem early on in his Jewish education, and he was immensely attracted. He was attracted both to Sholem's own path of what has been called dissimulation, movement away from the assimilatory path of his parents and grandparents. And he was also drawn to what Sholem studied, the raw animating force of Kabbalah, which challenged, provoked, and redefined the normative law-based world of rabbinic Judaism. Now, curiously, Sholem makes no appearance, appearance, as far as I know, 
in the first Diasporas Manifesto of 1988, but he is amply represented in the second from 2007. And in the course of those 19 years, Kitai's sense of diasporist estrangement, his sense of grievance from anti-Semitism, and his own very profound personal loss took a decidedly mystical turn. Sholem was his guide, particularly in introducing Kitai to the notion of the Shekhinah, which in the language of the Kabbalah refers to the female facet or personality of God. This is a particularly powerful image in the liturgy surrounding the Jewish Sabbath, where the feminine quality of God's presence as the Sabbath queen is foregrounded. For Kitai, Sholem led him to an extraordinary artistic and theological revelation. The equation of the Shekhinah, the feminine side of God, with his late wife Sandra, who died in 1994. <clears throat> this is not a wild pop psychology diagnosis. Kitai says it unambiguously in the Second Manifesto. Sandra, Shechina in my paintings, and it is she to whom I pray every dawn. Or elsewhere, Sandra is not only made in the image of God, but as Shechina, she's the aspect of what is called God, to which I cleave in painting her. This new mystical turn in Kitai's thinking and painting gained real momentum in the last 10 years of his life, the Los Angeles phase. It is there that he came after the Tate debacle, wounded, estranged, isolated, and yet still very much alive to his art, to ideas, to his family. And it was in that state that Kitai crafted his own heretical theology, a theology of estrangement whose redemption came through clinging, which is a technical term in the Kabbalah, to the spirit of his beloved Sandra. Here I have to report, on the basis of many personal conversations with him, that this act of apotheosis was not metaphorical. Kitai, the lifelong atheist, the secular Jew par excellence, actually seemed to believe in, and is, in his own way, pray to Sandra as the female godhead, Shechina. It was poignant, touching, quite literally incredible, and a reflection of the unique mix of arcane erudition, lingering hope, and loneliness that marked Kitai in, the, in this last phase of his life. He performed this theology, we might say, in one of the two Jewish spaces that he favored most in Los Angeles, his own private shul or synagogue, namely the Yellow Studio. Now, by way of conclusion, I want to discuss as our fifth and final concept the other Jewish space that he favored, both in Los Angeles and throughout his life, what we might call his own portable homeland, the cafe. The cafe has a storied place in this city and in the history of European Jewry. It was at once the university and the parliament of the diaspora Jew, the base medrash, the study hall, and the Gemeinde House together. Kitai knew well of the cafe culture of Berlin, of the cafes where Jewish intellectuals, artists, and ideologues met and debated the key issues of the day, where East met West, Ostjuden and Yekes joined together in cacophonous clatter, like distant relatives happening onto the same inn, as the poet Bialik put it. The cafe was where Kitai made his way every morning in Los Angeles, arriving at the coffee bean in Westwood Village promptly at 6 a.m. There he would muse, reflect, draw, sketch, and write in his inimitable slanted block letters so familiar to his friends. It was there that Kitai wrote his memorable letters and postcards and conjured up his second manifesto, his autobiographical reflections, and even the germ of a third diasporist manifesto. 
And just as he communed with Sandra in his studio, so the lonely Kitai shared the company of his fellow cafeists in the cafe. Not his own contemporaries, but rather the great Jewish intellectuals of the 20th century, beginning with Kafka, Echad Am, Buber, Rosenzweig, Dubnov, Arendt, Warburg, Scholem, and of course Scholem's great friend, Walter Benjamin, whom Kitai called the exemplary and perhaps ultimate diasporist. In the rich imaginary life that he led in Los Angeles, and without the company of his beloved Sandra, Kitai debated, provoked, and entertained his cafe friends. Conversely, it was they who inspired and prodded him to write. It was they, those mythic figures of yore, who pushed him to address the unsolved Jewish question again and again, who dared him to enter the labyrinth of the Kabbalah and assert his own voice as a commentator, and who encouraged him to remain true to his diasporist roots without abandoning his ingrained tribalism. That unique, rare combination of pursuits made Kitai, I think, a unique figure in contemporary Jewish life and permits us to say that to the pantheon, or perhaps the yeshiva shalmala, of great Jewish intellectuals in the modern age, R.B. Kitai justly belongs. Thank you very much. Thank you.